know what we're like because I think we're ready. We're now live, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, Thank you, Mr. Bielamega, and welcome everyone to the Energy, Climate Change, Environmental Justice, and River uh, Committee Thank meeting you. today, August 4th. Uh, and I'm joined by my colleagues, Mr. De Leon, Mr. Sedillo, Mr. Krikorian. Uh, Mr. Koretz uh, will not be present today. He has a, another obligation, but we have quorum. Before I turn it over to our clerk to call the roll, I'd like to remind everyone to make sure they're on mute when not speaking. With that, Mr. Villanueva, please uh, call the roll. Certainly, Mr. Chair. Councilmember Mitchell Farrell. Present. Councilmember Gil Cedillo. Present. Councilmember Kevin De Leon. Present. Ah, uh, here. Councilmember Paul Krikorian. Here. Here. You have a call, room, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. Uh, we'll now hear from the public who wish to comment on items that are specific to today's agenda, including one minute for general public comment, if so requested. Our city attorney, uh, Ms. Cadigan Heard, will now explain the speaking rules to the members of the public who are calling in, and our city clerk will provide the necessary information for the public to dial in. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To members of the public calling in, when it is your time to speak, please state which of the agenda items you'd like to speak on. You have one minute per item to speak, up to two minutes total. We will, and up to one minute for general public comment. We will tell you when your time is up. When speaking on the agenda items, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you are not speaking on topic, or if we cannot tell whether you are speaking on a specific agenda item, you will get one brief warning from me or the chair. If you do not immediately get clearly on topic or again straight off topic, the chair will cut you off and you will forfeit the rest of your speaking time and we will move on to the next speaker. Please press star 9 to request to speak. As soon as you hear someone address you on the phone, please press star 6 and state your name and state which agenda items you would like to speak on. We know the situation is not ideal and thank you for your cooperation as we do the best we can. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam City Attorney. Uh, and now, Mr. Bill if you could please read the instructions to call in. Certainly, sir. Members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call 1-669-254-5252. Again, the number is 669-254-5252. And use meeting ID number 160 Nine one nine four four five nine. Again, the number is one six zero nine one nine four four five nine. And then press pound. Press pound again when prompted for participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star nine to request to speak. Thank you, Mr. Bielwego. With that, we are ready to take our first caller. Uh, so please bring them in. Thank you. Mr. Chair, there are no speakers on the queue at this time. No speakers on the queue at this time. Uh, let the record reflect that it is 10.07. There are no speakers on the queue. Uh, we will now close public comment, and we will move forward with our agenda. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, if there's no objection, I'd like to move uh, items 1 through 6 and 8. Okay. On consent. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Sedillo has seconded. Uh, Mr. Villanueva, please call the roll. Councilmember Micho Farrell. Aye. Councilmember Gil Sedillo. Sedillo, aye. Councilmember Kevin De Leon. Aye. Councilmember Paul Krikorian. Aye. Those items are approved, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. We just uh, uh, voted to approve one reappointment and two new appointments to the various commissions, and they include. Uh, Ms. Heather Penny to the Metropolitan Water District of SoCal, Ms. Joanne D'Antonio and Ms. Laura Hall to the Community Forest Advisory Committee. So I just want to take a moment, uh, in case they're tuning in or even if they're not, to thank them all for volunteering their time to serve on these important commissions. We are incredibly grateful to have commissioners of your expertise advising on these important issues. Uh, your service ensures that the city's interests are well represented, so we thank you. And with that, 
I'd like to move on to item seven. Please read the item, Mr. Sutton Willis. Yes, good morning, everyone. This is Blaine Sutton Willis with the CLA's office. The Los Angeles Department of Water and Power report relative to the initial indication of water supply conditions, drought response actions, and DWP rate pair impacts and impacts to hydroelectric resources and implications to reaching 100% carbon free electricity as a result of the current drought crisis. Thank you, sir. Uh, and colleagues, the unprecedented drought conditions across the southwestern U.S. requires us to act promptly and decisively. In much of the southwest, the drought intensity is extreme. In these last three years alone, from 2019 to 2022, have been the driest on record. And this year, we have the driest months between January and March ever recorded. Because of these conditions, Governor Newsom first imposed statewide water restrictions this past March. In May, Mayor Garcetti recommended that the city move to phase three of the LA City Water Conservation Ordinance. And with committee and council's concern, uh, concurrence, we've done just that uh, and done very well at it. We're going to hear some details in a moment. So we'll discuss uh, Angelina's response to these dynamics. I've asked the Department of Water and Power to, to provide an update on drought conditions, water use, conservation and customer incentives, including any impacts that the drought is having or will have on our renewable energy goals, LA 100 by 2035. Additionally, we also have staff from sanitation to answer questions related to water recycling efforts and policy. Climate change, human ac driven activity that is the major are the major drivers of this mega drought. We're working with our partner agencies, city departments, and other jurisdictions to meet these challenges head on. Global temperatures rising as the result of greenhouse gas emissions, including methane, nitrous oxide, CO2. They've all had major global increases in the last 32 years. The drought is regional and impacts everyone. Not just people, but the wildlife that live in and around California rivers, streams and wetlands, and plant life. Uh, this is the first of a two-part report, with the full report coming back in September or October. And with that, I'll now hand it off to Anselmo Collins from LADWP to walk us through uh, this initial presentation and report. Uh, Mr. Collins, please take the floor. Good morning, Council Members, and thank you very much. Uh, my name is Anselmo Collins. I am the Senior Assistant General Manager in charge of the water system for LADWP. And I'm, I'm very happy to be here today to talk to you about the drought. So I am going to go, uh, hopefully you can hear me properly. Can you hear me? Okay, very good. Yes. Okay, thank you, Council Member. Just, just double checking. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Very good. So hopefully you're able to see my screen. So uh, once again, I'm Selma Collins from LADWP, and I'm very happy to be here today, uh, council members, to uh, give you a quick briefing on how we're doing when it comes to the drought response. So th the first thing that I wanted to show you, uh, what you're looking at here is a drought monitoring map for the United States. This is the western part of the United States. And what you can see here by the darker colors is that most of the southwestern portion of the country is in some level of drought. Uh, the darker browns is, is an exceptional drought, and the red color is an extreme drought. So as you can tell from here, the Southern California area, as well as the surrounding area, it, it right now it's, it's in an extreme or exceptional drought condition. So when we compare this to um, LA itself, or how it relates to us, the, the larger blue circle that you see, that is actually part of the Colorado River uh, watershed. And I can tell you that uh, right now, Lake Mead, as well as Lake Powell, are around 25 to 26% of normal. So they're historic low levels, and which is very concerning. Uh, consequently, earlier this year, in January, the, the lower basin states, for the first time ever, there was a declaration of a shortage. Now, that declaration did not impact the state of California yet. It impacted Mexico, Arizona, and Nevada. And that is based, is triggered by the elevation of, of Lake Mead. 
Now, based on what we're seeing, and if the conditions continue the way we're seeing it, there is a pretty good chance that by 2024, the state of California, specifically the Metropolitan Water District, will have to also be on some kind of shortage and have to contribute leaving some water behind. So this is obviously quite concerning. On the same map, if you look over the northern part of California, you see another circle. That is the portion that is the watershed contributing to the state water project. And I can tell you that in the state water project, the, the major reservoirs like Lake Oroville, as well as San Luis Reservoir, are also historic low levels. There are 41 and 32% of capacity, respectively. So consequently, we are in a pretty significant situation, dire situation. As a result of that, the Department of Water Resources uh, basically had an allocation of 5% from the state water project to the Metropolitan Water District. What does that mean? What it means is that MWD can typically buy close to 2 million acre feet of water a year from the state water project. This year, all they can get is 100,000 acre feet from, from that allocation, because that's the 5%, which means that the member agencies that buy water from Metropolitan Water District, depending exclusively on the state water project, have a limitation on that source of water. And as you know, when Metropolitan took action to declare this emergency, they identified specifically six member agencies that are impacted by, by this allocation. LADUP being one of them, and the largest one, as well as Cayegas, Las Virginis, Inland Empire, Three Valleys, Upper San Gabriel uh, Valley Municipal District. Those are the six agencies that are impacted by this. On the next slide over here, this kind of shows your chronology of what's happened. So back in May, May 10 to be specific, the mayor as well as the council uh, basically announced to the Angelinos that we were gonna be moving from phase two of our water conservation ordinance which has been in place since 2009, by the way, and it limited irrigation, outdoor irrigation to three days a week, we moved to phase two, which limits basically, sorry, the phase three, sorry, which limits us to two days a week of watering only. And that was to start on June 1st. The great thing is as soon as the announcement was made by the mayor, we saw a reduction in the consumption of water by our customers of 3%. This is before the phase three ordinance was in, in, in effect. When we got to the month of June, we actually saw a reduction of 9%. This is compared to 2021. So we look at June 2021, we saw 9% reduction in 2022. And that is despite the fact that June 2022 was about one of the warmest Junes that we've had. And the consumption has been the lowest that we've had us since the 1970s. So it clearly demonstrates that Angelinos listen to the message that was delivered. And by the way, for those of you who are not aware, the water restrictions of the two days depends on which days, depends on your address. If you're, if you're on, it will be on Mondays and Fridays. If your address is even, it's on Sundays and Thursdays. So fast forward then to July. Well, it's even more encouraging. What we're seeing now is that for the month of July, we're estimating we're gonna have a reduction of 11%. So that's 11% compared to 2021, and it's about 11% also compared to 2020. So we certainly are going in the right direction when it comes to water conservation. One, one thing I wanted to add on is that um, last Friday I had an opportunity to go to um, a meeting with the governor, Governor Newsom. As you know, the governor has asked us voluntarily to reduce 15%, and he was quite encouraged to see that all the agencies are moving in the right direction. We're not quite there yet. However, he's made it clear that he's very supportive. And of course, he always has the option to implement mandatory uh, reductions. And he's holding off on that because he's seeing the great progress that all the agencies are making. So uh, to me, that, that was a sign of really good news uh, from the governor, but certainly he's been very vigilant and we're gonna be meeting with him again in the next couple of months again to update him on how we're doing uh, as a region. So the next slide basically kind of shows you some of the uh, programs that we have to help our customers. Obviously, you probably heard that we have many rebate programs, uh, rebate programs for toilets, for clothes, for washing machines, for turf replacement. But we also have now additional programs to help our customers be able to take advantage of these rebates. 
we have a turf replacement design a program. This allows homeowners to be able to see exactly what their yards can look like once they remove the turf and they install drought tolerant material. I think most of us don't have the ability to picture, to picture that and visualize it. So these design services allow the, the customer to see exactly what it will look like. We are also uh, about to launch or relaunch a partnership with a Southern California gas company where we're going to be able to do direct install. This is a direct install where we're going to have contractors be able to go into people's homes and be able to replace uh, faucets and clothes washers and any artifact that is not water efficient with water efficient, you know, artifacts. As a matter of fact, we expanded it now to also include the washing machines that are in the common areas. And we're exploring the ability to perhaps even do turf replacement. The great thing about this is that it also provides an opportunity for us to be able to target specifically the underserved communities by being able to uh, go to them and make some of these improvements that are badly needed in order to be able to comply with the, the water conservation ordinance. And that is the last of my slides. I wanted to just open it up now to any questions that the council members might have of me. Thank you. And so, well, thank you so much. And um, uh, this, this uh, phase three um, conservation requirement has been a smash success. So congratulations on that. And the fact that July is looking uh, two percent better, and we're up to eleven. is is just really terrific. And I don't like trafficking in generalizations, but I'll say it again: Angelinos are conservationists by nature. It's in our blood. So when when we are given the task to conserve, um, then we collectively pitch in. So so really, job well done. Uh, I. Uh, I have a few questions here. There's some questions, and I'll just kind of power through them, and then, and then uh, we'll open up the floor. So it's been reported that in Northern California, they've conserved more water than us, uh, without going me going into specifics because I have my own sort of perspective on this. What's what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, um, I, I will say, Council Member, that I think that when I look at Angelinos in Southern California in general, but specifically Angelinos. The one thing that I think we need to really keep in mind is that in the last 15 years, Angelinos have reduced their consumption by approximately 30%. So the new requirements and request to save another 15% is on top of what we've done already. So definitely the, the idea of being able to save more is a bit more of a challenge when you already have done such a great job. Uh, despite that, I, I will say that I think Angelinos are doing a great job in doing it. Obviously, there are local differences uh, between temperature and, and things like that that you need to take into account. But I can tell you that even as a region, when I had an opportunity to go to the meeting with Governor Newsom, uh, as a member of the California Urban Water Agencies, and we are a collective of some of the 11 of the largest utilities, water utilities in the state. As a collective, we represent two thirds of the population of California. And the numbers that we're seeing in LA are tracking pretty closely to all the other 10 member agencies that are part of the California Urban Water Agencies. So I think for us, the, the important thing to remember is that we've saved significantly already. We will continue saving more, and we believe that we can do so. We have great programs, as well as assistance that we can provide to our customers, but we also have a great messaging that we're putting out there. Uh, actually, before May, when the, when the mayor announced that we're going to phase three, we already had initiated our messaging uh, a program. And we first started with reminding Angelinos to conserve water. We obviously messaged going from three days to two days. And we were able to go to traditional media, you know, newspaper, uh, the radios. We were also doing social media. We have done dozens and dozens of interviews that I think have been very well received. And I think that message is percolating with all of Angelinos. And I think that's the reason why we're seeing these numbers. And we do expect them to increase and improve. Thank you. Yes, I, I think in the, in the broader context of things, LA region had a head start in water conservation. So uh, I think the report uh, is uh, unintentionally misleading. Uh, and we should, we should be very proud of, of our accomplishment. We'll do more. 
we are going to do more. So um, thank you for that. Um, question, what's the long-term thinking as the drought just drags into 2023 and very possibly, maybe even likely beyond? So I want to know what's our strategy if the drought reaches what I would describe as biblical proportions. And some people already feel that we're there. So what, is, what are your thoughts on a long-term strategy of a decades-long drought? What do we do? Well, I think when it comes to a, a decades-long drought, and as you know, this is cyclical. We've had other droughts. We had one that ended in 2015 or so. We had one back in, in early in the 2000s. And um, what we have done is that we recognize that we need to have more local water resources. We want to become what we call drought proof. And the way that we're doing that, <laughs> excuse me, is, is, is a multi plan approach. Obviously, conservation is a huge part of, of our strategy, but we're also looking at developing more local water supply. Uh, so a couple of things that we're doing. We have a pretty robust stormwater capture program where we're being, whenever we do have rain, our goal is to capture as much of that water as possible and be able to have it percolate down into the, into the groundwater basin and recharge the groundwater basin. You know, in addition to that, as you probably know, in the San Fernando Valley, we do have, unfortunately, contamination in the basin. So we currently have uh, three projects that are in construction, and the goal of those projects is to remediate the groundwater basin. What we're going to be doing is, when we complete them, is pump out the plume of contaminated water, remove the contamination, take that water, treat it, put it into the system, but improve the, the basin in general by removing the contamination. So once again, we are doing the stormwater capture, we're doing the groundwater remediation, and then the other big part of it too is going to be uh, additional recycling. As you know, we have an Operation Next, and the goal of Operation Next is to really recycle 100% of the effluent from the Hyperion Water Reclamation Plant. Uh, if they, when this program is completed, the great thing about it is that it can give us access to up to 240,000 acre feet of water a year. So that's going to be the game changer. And that's going to allow Los Angeles to be more drought proof. Our goal is to be more resilient, more sustainable, and more reliable. And so, well, thank you for that. And um, uh, a question about water conservation. We know that commercial uses a lot more water than residential. So we know that residential customers have really stepped up. Um, how's that going with the commercial water consumers? Yeah, great question, Council Member. Uh, actually, around 67% of our consumption comes from our residential customers, as a matter of fact. And the rest comes from commercial. But with that said, you know, our programs also are targeting the, the commercial, industrial, institutional customers that we have. Uh, one of the things that we've done is we have a technical assistance program. That program used to basically provide around $250,000 in incentives for our commercial customers to implement water-saving devices in their place of business. Well, uh, last year, we increased that to $2 million. And the idea is that they're able to implement water-saving or install water-saving devices in their places of business, like, for example, cooling towers, and be able to reduce significantly their water consumption. Um, when it comes to irrigation, for example, they're also limited to the two days a week equal to our, our residential customers. So it is going well, and uh, we are always engaging with our commercial customers to find ways to help them help us meet the goal of conserving. Thank you. And does that include privately owned golf courses? Because I know that our city owned golf courses, 85% of the water is recycled. Yes, that, that is correct. If, if there's a private golf course that is in the vicinity of a recycled water pipe, um, certainly we encourage them to connect to it and be able to use recycled water to irrigate. You are 100% correct. Most of the municipal owned courses are on recycled water, as well as many of the parks that Recreation and Parks manages are on recycled water as well. So our goal is to be able to have all open space, whether they're golf courses or parks, to be on, on recycled water. Thanks, and so much. So you would, you would uh, uh, agree with this statement, and that is your incentive for commercial properties has been a good return on investment for these incentives? 
I would say that absolutely, yes, it is. Great. Thank you. Um, so what incentive programs do work the best? And do you all go through these various incentive programs and say, okay, this one isn't a good return on investment. Uh, let's set that one aside. And do you just kind of focus in on, on what is successful and, and how, how do you measure that? Sure. I, I would say the quite the most successful and most impacting of all the rebate programs that we have in the turf replacement. And the reason why I say that is because um, when Governor Brown was in office, he had a goal to, re to replace 50 million square feet of turf for the entire state. Just the city of, California, city of Los Angeles, we have been able to replace 51 million square feet of turf with drought tolerant material. And the reason why that's been very significant is because, as you know, a, a high percentage of the water that's used in a home is outdoors, it's for irrigation purposes. So when you take that, that is a significant increase in the amount of conservation by doing that. We have other programs that are also important. Um, for example, we have a, a program to replace uh, toilets, uh, washing machines, uh, faucets, uh, shower heads. I, I wouldn't say that one is better than the other, but clearly because you use more water irrigating when you switch from turf to dry powder material, I think the impact is, is a lot greater. But I think all these programs are extremely important to make sure that we are able to, to meet our, our goals. Now, the one thing, Council Member, that I, I will add is a couple of exciting programs that we are working on. Um, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to hear about a real-time monitoring device. It's called Flu. And what this is, is a, a device that you can take, basically strap onto your, your water meter, you connect it to your Wi-Fi at home, and you'll be able to get real-time information on your water consumption on your cell phone. And the reason why that's important is because, as you know, the DEP bill is sent out every two months. And if we want our customers to change their habits and to change their practices, the best way to do that is to provide them with all the information that they need to make those informed decisions. And it's, it's a very simple device to install. You have the information on, on, on your cell phone. You'll be able to see how much water you're using on a daily basis. You'll be able to set alarms that can let you also know uh, if you're using too much water. The great part is that, let's say, for example, you had a leak the device will be able to alert you that you've had water running for an extended period of time. And then you can go home and you can investigate and figure out where it is and address that particular issue. So that's a pretty exciting program that, we, um, that we're gonna be uh, launching pretty soon. So I would say all of them are very important and I would encourage Angelinos to take advantage of these programs because they can not only help them save water, but also save money. And I think everybody wants to save money nowadays. That sounds great. So that program will be launched soon, weeks yeah. or months? Uh, no, it'll be weeks. As a matter of fact, if you go to our website right now, our customers can see where it, it, it has a, a link to the uh, to that program. We are going to be making an announcement, in the, I believe, next week. That's going to be announcing it to everybody that the program is available. And I encourage every Angelino to take advantage of that program. It is, it is very important to, to know exactly how you're using what at home. What I've noticed is most people don't really know how much water they use. Yeah. They usually react when they see the water bill later. Well, this gives you the opportunity to proactively take steps at home. Whether you, you, shut, you cut down the number, the, how much time you spend showering, uh, obviously how much time you're irrigating is important, but the other water uses, and you can manage that a lot better. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, let's talk briefly about drier conditions, drought conditions. Uh, and old aging infrastructure. So these, there's, there's a clash here with that uh, in, in not a good way. So could you describe the under, underground conveyance system and how and where we store water regionally and what's the responsible party for this conveyance? Yeah, okay, no, that's a great question. So um, as, you, as you know, the city of LA benefits from the fact that we have multiple sources of water. We have the LA Aqueduct, obviously, which is our foundational source of supply. But we also purchase water from the Metropolitan Water District. We can buy it either from the State Water Project or from the Colorado River Aqueduct. Locally, we have local groundwater that we use. And then it also, we have then conservation. Now, the challenge here, uh, Council Member, is that, yes, we are in a drought. 
But what is making this drug even more difficult is the fact that Los Angeles and Jolinos have invested a significant amount of money in regional storage. Th that storage that's owned and operated by the Metropolitan Water District. For example, in Diamond Valley Reservoir, and also water they store in the actual Colorado River itself. Unfortunately, not all parts of the city of LA are able to have access to that water. In other words, if they lack the pipes and pump stations to take the water from the east side and move it all the way across our service area to the westernmost part of our service territory. So consequently, that's the reason why we are only one of six agencies that have been asked to cut down, I mean, put, basically been put in a water budget. Portion of our service territory can get water from the Colorado River and from that storage that we help pay for. But other parts physically cannot get that water. So we have been working very closely with the Metropolitan Water District and urging them to work on a program to install the infrastructure that would allow them to move that water all the way to the west portion of our service territory. We've been in constant communication with the general manager and their chief operating officer, and uh, they're currently working on identifying options and alternatives that we hope will address the situation. Great, and hopefully we'll report back soon on how those conversations are going. Let me know what I need to do if we need to, to, to do take a council action on it or whatever, but I'll we'll schedule a report on this particular issue for a, a near future um, meeting. Uh, 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 committee hearing. Great. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so, um, last question that I have, I'm taking up all the oxygen here, sorry, sorry uh, colleagues, but um, gray water ordinance. So San Francisco has one. They recently adopted it. In this time of historic drought, if we were to do something similar, how would recycling potentially large amounts of water impact our sewer or storm drains? And what are because we, we really need to do this, uh, but what are the major factors or challenges in doing so? Yeah, I, I think that when you're talking about great water systems, um, first of all, you might need to follow public health guidelines for the implementation. And it might be difficult for most existing plumbing systems to comply with ex extensive overhauls of their system uh, to be able to use non potable uh, water. However, we do believe that some of these requirements for new construction uh, of, uh, to plumb buildings for great water to use for landscape in the future is something that will happen. And I think that's a potential there. Thank you. And I, and I understand Hugh, uh, thanks, Senator, uh, Hugh Cox is here from sanitation. Uh, perhaps sanitation could weigh in as well. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. <laughs> I uh, hope you can all hear me. My name is uh, Huub Cox. I'm with LA Sanitation and Environment overseeing the Recycle Water Program. To answer your question about the impact of large-scale gray water uh, recycling on our sewer system, uh, we anticipate that there would definitely be an impact. And the reason for that is that um, by using more gray water, water in the city, the volume of sewage would go down. However, the amount of waste in our sewer conveyance system would still be the same because that is related to the number of people in Los Angeles. So what it all boils down to that is that as there is more gray water being used in the city, the sewage in our collection system will become more concentrated and it will become thicker, if you will. And there are several implications to our conveyance system as well as to our water reclamation plans. And I just want to briefly mention those to you. Uh, first of all, uh, we anticipate that there will be more deposits of solids in the sewer system, which can then result in a higher risk of blockages in our sewer system. And of course, that would then potentially result in a higher risk of sewage spills. Now, secondly, uh, more concentrated sewage also means uh, more odor emissions from our sewers and from our water reclamation plants. And consequently, that could result in an elevated risk of odor complaints from people close to the sewer system or the water reclamation plants. Now, lastly, um, more concentrated sewage 
can also result in faster and more extensive corrosion of our sewer pipes. So all in all, to, to negate those impacts uh, on our sewer system, as well as our water reclamation plants, we would anticipate that the cost uh, of operating and maintaining the sewer system will increase if grey water would be implemented at a large scale in the city of Los Angeles. Um, to also briefly discuss our storm drain system, what are the potential impacts of grey water on our storm drain system, uh, we anticipate that those impacts are much less, if any at all. And the reason for that is that our storm drain system and our sewer system in Los Angeles are two completely separated systems. And neither wastewater or gray water or recycled water, it doesn't belong in our storm drain system to begin with. Thank you, you And see how glamorous this committee is? We talk sewage and solid waste like it's just nothing. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you for that. So, thank you. Maybe you could report back. Sanitation could report back on um, you know bifurcating some sort of gray water plan so that we start with storm drains, the storm drain system. Maybe we could talk about that in a future hearing. Absolutely. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. All right. With that, calling Mr. Krikorian. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the, the motion. And uh, Mr. Collins, thank you for your report. Um, I, I can't resist first responding, Mr. Chair, to your question about Northern California, because it's a particularly sore point for me. Um, this Southern California as a whole, in the LADWP in particular, and MWD, have set the standard for water conservation uh, over the last 30 years. Um, we, as we often say, we have conserved enough water to serve the needs of a million new customers over that time period. Meanwhile, when I was a member of the state legislature about 15 years ago and lived part of my time in Sacramento, Sacramento did not yet have water meters. Um, you could just use whatever amount of water you wanted to. Um, and it, it's criminal uh, that this misinformation that continues to get generated um, by, particularly by Northern Californian sources, that somehow LA is just stealing all the water from Northern California uh, when we are setting the standard for conservation and they have a lot of catching up to do. So uh, I just, uh, I don't think we need any further comment on that. I just wanted to point that out. Um, and Mr. Collins, thank you for your thorough report about what we're doing, steps we're taking for conservation right now. Um, I was really more interested uh, in taking a, a step back and looking at this a little bit more strategically and globally uh, than, than what we're doing. Because I think when we focus uh, on the trees of conservation, we it can lose the forest and um, the, you know we talk about drought and our constituents think okay well I have to take you know shorter showers for uh, this year until the rains come back and then you know we can go back to normal and I, I just think that we're at the end of that kind of thinking it was probably never sound thinking uh, to think of droughts as um, just being cyclical phenomenon, because while that's true, the cycle continues to spiral downward. So, and it will continue to. Um, so, I really wanted to look at this a little bit more strategically. Just a few days ago, the United Nations issued a report warning that our largest reservoirs in the country, Lake Mead and Lake Powell, are at such low levels because of climate change and overconsumption that they're, you know, um, at risk of reaching a status where they become dead pools. Um, and, you know, to me, this should be more of a red, alarm, red sirens and uh, red 
red lights and sirens alarm about the permanent crisis situation of water insecurity in the Western United States and all that that means. Um, and of particular concern, which we didn't really talk, talk about much, is um, the impact on our reaching our LA 100 goals um, and power reliability in general. Uh, you know, one of our biggest baseload sources of power is hydro that we get from the Hoover and, and other places like Mead and Lake Powell. And um, one of our most important ways of storing uh, power, uh, and which will become more important as we get more and more reliant on intermittent sources like solar, is the pump storage uh, that we do at Castaic. So do we, can somebody from the department talk to us a little bit about the risks to our um, ability to rely on um, hydroelectric uh, and pumped uh, storage power and um, what we're doing to anticipate that, um, how big of a crisis situation the low water levels uh, are creating and you know what are we doing to fend off the anticipated increase in that risk that's going to come as climate change continues to reduce our water reliability thank you council member um i believe jason randall from the power system one of my counterparts is on the call as well i'm going to let him address that question Please. thank you and so yeah uh, jason randall director of resource planning development and programs and i'm joined uh, by Jay Lim, who manages our integrated resource planning, as well as Nermina Rusich uh, O'Neill, who is the senior manager of our generating station engineering. Um, just at a very high level, uh, as this uh, committee knows very well, we completed the LA 100 study last year. It showed the major investments that it will take to get 100% renewable energy. But it also looked at some risks, not all risks, and there are many risks in uh, us achieving these goals. Uh, some of them are within our control and some of them are not within our control. The risks that that study did look at is high heat. What was the impact of high heat to load, um, load growth, and our ability to serve load reliably. It also looked at wildfire risk. What if we lose our ability to import renewable energy into the city and, and wildfires impacted that? One risk that it did not look at is sustained drought. Um, there are other climate risks that it did not look at. Uh, so right now we're in the process of looking at that and we, that will be part of our future power plans. But we do have an idea of what it will mean in the near term for us if there is sustained reduced usage or utilization at Hoover um, and also at Castaic if, there, if our ability to pump uh, uh, water at Castaic is impacted. The risks of those two facilities are a little bit different. Um, and I'd like to, to call on uh, Nermina uh, to just give a really quick overview of what uh, Hoover means for us from a power perspective and what the risk is there. And then also, again, a, a little bit of a lower risk at Castaic, but should that risk manifest itself, the impact would be, uh, impact would be significant. And we can talk a little bit about that. Uh, Nermina, could you share um, a little bit about uh, Hoover and, and what that means for our power system? Definitely. Uh, good morning. And uh, to address the issue of drought for our hydro station, I'll first start with our uh, aqueduct plants that are built along the aqueduct. And they basically run on availability water as we provide supply supply from Crowley Lake down to Los Angeles. And they represent 1.4% of our capacity portfolio, and they are quite small uh, aqueduct plants of one, two, three megawatt. However, one of the biggest uh, hydropower plants that we own is, as you know, a stake hydro plant located on California State uh, Aqueduct, and it uh, uh, operates by generating power as the waters pass between Pyramid Lake uh, Reservoir to Castaic Reservoir. And in addition to that, LADWP has an agreement with California Department of Water Resources to generate 10,000 acre feet uh, of water and then pump that water back to 
into a pyramid. Uh, the situation with uh, Kasek has been observed for the decades and the levels of Pyramid Lake has not have not dropped below 90%, unlike Orwell Lake that Osama talk about. So therefore, with these conditions, we do not see current impact on drought on operations of Castaic, which is very important as a, as a barrier, as a hydro storage which we utilize to uh, pump during the surplus of the renewables and then generate during the peak hours. Now, now not to say that we should not be planning for a long-term future, as we see that how over the decades drought has affected Mead, Powell, Oral, uh, dams, and as a part of that, our long-term strategic planning group is looking at other forms of the firm generation green generation such as geothermal uh, geothermal, or uh, in terms of castaic more so uh, battery storage that would have to be planned for and purchased way in advance to replace this uh, pump uh, storage. In terms of Hoover, uh, the situation is very different. You heard that uh, it's it's a kind of biblical proportion situation in terms of the drought and levels of uh, Lake Mead. And LEDWP through a uh, uh, PPA agreement with WAPA, the Balancing Authority for Hoover, uh, has agreement of guaranteed uh, agreement of uh, 23 percent of uh, capacity of 2,000 total of Hoover. We get translate to 495 megawatts now. Because of the depletion of the water in the lake, we do not get that capacity. We get 70% of that. So what LADWP needs to start looking at how to replace that capacity. And like I said, our planning uh, groups have already been looking in geothermal or some other replacement capacity. Uh, as we see that the levels in Lake Mead will continue to reduce in the future. Thank you, I think uh, just to, you know, make sure that we um, know the, the takeaways for this, as Namina said, for Hoover, there's, there are some impacts today. The way we address, the way we will have to address those impacts is we're going to have to procure new ener more energy. There's a cost to that. Geothermal energy costs about 10 times what uh, mm -hmm. Hoover energy costs. So there will be a ratepayer impact because of that, uh, that situation. Um, it's roughly estimated, again, this is going to depend on market conditions when we actually get to the point where we procure, but that cost will be between 13 and $18 million per year uh, for ratepayers. Um, they, we don't expect there to be a reliability impact due to that in the near term, so we, we are confident that we'll have the ability to continue to provide reliable power, so that's the situation at Hoover. And again, just to cap this off, Castaic, we don't see an immediate risk, however, one of the things that we need to do as part of power planners is ask ourselves what's the sort of worst case scenario and what do we do to respond to that. So we need to better understand that. And so what we're doing is we're updating our power planning to make sure that we're looking at all climate risks so that if we do start to trend towards a situation where Castaic does not serve that purpose of being able to pump energy, we know that we need to initiate procurement of substantial amounts of battery storage, which would have a very, very significant issue uh, impact to rate pairs. Again, we are not at that point. We do not project to be at that point, but we want to understand how to uh, identify when we're trending towards that point. So all of those factors are being uh, anticipated and analyzed as part of the strategic long-term resources plan. Uh, the near-term impacts at, at Hoover will be understood uh, as part of this power planning uh, effort. The very long-term, the sort of low risk, but really high impact uh, of a castaic will have to be understood as part of a future power planning effort. Okay. Um, so I, I just want to reinforce the point about Hoover just a bit, because what is, when, when we're talking about 495 megawatts of uh, uh, capacity, um, what does that translate to in terms of our load, as a percentage of our load? Very roughly, and Nermita can correct me if I'm wrong, or Jay, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe um, the the total of our hydro resources, both our lar large hydro at uh, Hoover, as well as the small hydro from our um, power plants along um, uh, 
uh, power plant one and two is somewhere between six and seven percent. It will vary year to year, um, uh, but I believe uh, most recently it's been about six to seven percent. Okay. Uh, thank you. And uh, before I, I have another area of questioning, Mr. Chair, but I see that Dr. Pickle wanted to, to comment, I assume, on this. So if maybe we could go to Dr. Pickle first. I agree. That's a great idea for, for now. Dr. Pickle, uh, please uh, go ahead. Maybe I'm anticipating your next question, but uh, my concern is the drought not only affects uh, LA's power situation and hydro resources, but uh, parts of the uh, the West that we are all interconnected with uh, are uh, have a high percentage of hydro resources. Uh, BC Hydro is uh, over 90% hydro out of two major river basins, uh, although their their uh, fossil usage is 2%. So they're they're they are or have been born with a situation we'd love to, all love to have uh, at this point. Um, but um, there are two major multi-year hydroelectric basins in the West where storage can be saved over up to six years. One of them is the Peace River Basin in northern British Columbia uh, that flows into the Yukon and flows into the Arctic Ocean. Um, the other major multi-year river basin is the Colorado ba Basin, and the Colorado's in trouble right now. Uh, and uh, so that affects our ability to integrate uh, renewable resources throughout the West because the storage in those river basins is key for helping us integrate hydro in throughout the West. Uh, the other uh, major ba basins like um, the Sacramento and the Columbia River are really only annual storage cycles. Um, and fortunately this year, the Pacific Northwest and the Columbia River ba Basin got doused late in the season. So they're doing okay on that front, but we've learned from past experience, uh, you can get situations where all the basins are dry at once. Uh, that hasn't happened since 20, or 2000, 2001, but everyone got in trouble in that time period. And physically, it took three years to straighten that out, and financially, uh, the financial fights are still not over yet, 20 years later. So um, we, we will have, uh, if others get into trouble, we have certain obligations that will be, uh, or will be upon us to help others. Uh, so that's a major thing to think about going forward. Yeah, and, and so I think the big takeaway from this is that when people think about water conservation and uh, turf replacement, doing other things that they're doing to save water, this is not just to ensure that um, you're going to avoid the crisis of not being able to turn on your tap and have water uh, coming out of your tap. It impacts like dominoes um, the entire western United States. It impacts our energy supply. It impacts uh, rates uh, and um, it impacts our continuing contribution to the very climate change that is causing it in the first place. So uh, if, if we don't take this much more seriously at a strategic level, you know, we will continue to have this, you know, um, this cyclical uh, problem that we're not um, converting to uh, clean energy fast enough. Therefore, we're impacting the uh, climate more. Therefore, temperatures continue to rise. Therefore, there's less water, and it, it, it becomes a, a, a vicious cycle that um, we need to break. So um, thank you for, for those points about the power impact. The other area that I wanted to talk about a little bit was what um, Chairman O'Farrell raised with regard to not just gray water, although that is of uh, interest to me. I, a number of years ago, I introduced a motion about having more gray water uh, infrastructure built into residential construction. I think it's the time is ripe to revisit that. Um, but uh, in terms of larger issues of use of recycled water, um, 
because we DWP again was a um, a leader in this area years ago, sanitation and DWP to try to um, help solve some of our water insecurity challenges by reclaiming wastewater and and stormwater. But but let's talk about wastewater for a moment. Um, and there has been you know political reluctance to push forward as aggressively as we need to be. So I want to ask you this, uh, Mr. Collins. Um, Las Vegas is a big city, a growing city, um, one of the fastest growing cities in America over the last couple of decades, and it's really, really far from the ocean. Um, I assume it has wastewater treatment facilities. So what does Las Vegas do with its wastewater? That's a great question, uh, Council Member. I'm not certain what they do with their wastewater. I, I don't want to venture out and guess. Oh, so. sorry. Okay, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. No, but, that's okay. That's well, okay. I, I happen to know. Um, so the, the, the wastewater treatment facility that Las Vegas uses, just like our wastewater treatment facilities uh, have their outflow into the Pacific Ocean, the outflow of the wastewater treatment facility of Las Vegas is Lake Mead which means the water that goes through their wastewater treatment system is the water that we end up drinking in Los Angeles. Um, many other cities that don't have coastal access similarly dispose of their wastewater into river systems and groundwater systems, and then it becomes part of our drink wa drinking water. And yet for some reason, there's reluctance in the city of Los Angeles to move forward in reclaiming uh, our wastewater uh, in the way that we know we can, with scientific certainty, that we can do in a safe way, uh, because all water is recycled and reclaimed. There has never been a new drop of water created. It's all reclaimed and recycled in the natural order of the water cycle. So. Um, I guess I, I don't have a question, and forgive me, members, I, I tend to rant on this, this topic because it so infuriates me that we're dumping our water, you know, out of Hyperion into the ocean when that water could be used to recharge our aquifer, uh, to, you know, better utilize our purple pipe system to um, use in terms of recharging and, and remediating uh, contaminated areas of, of the groundwater. And, and in my view, directly supplementing uh, our fresh uh, drinking water system. And so uh, does anybody have any comments on where we stand with moving forward with that kind of strategic change that's going to be necessary to prevent water insecurity in the future. Uh, Council Member Kikorian, I, I, all I can say is amen. I agree 100% with what you said. And we always tell everybody, all water is recycled. So um, I think that for the first time probably ever, I would say that the idea of using recycled water for consumption, um, finally we have the support of all the different parts. I think elected officials, I think our regulators, the public, they're all finally realizing that uh, we need, that's the way we need to go. As you know, the city of LA embarked on a recycle water program many years ago. Unfortunately, at that time, it was coined uh, toilet to tap. And basically, that just killed the program. And I think that set us back substantially in our efforts to go there. I think uh, luckily now, and, and of course, it's mainly because of the droughts that we've had, you know, the last one and this one, that uh, the state is working really hard at developing uh, rules for direct portable reuse. And, and we have seen the draft regulations. We are expecting to see the final regulations in early 2024. But I think finally you've seen a change in mindset. And for us, what we're looking at is Operation Next. Now, Operation Next, obviously, we want to be able to take the water from Hyperion, 100% of the effluent, treat it, and we're going to use it for two things. As you mentioned, one is to recharge our groundwater basins. We want to be able to recharge San Fernando, Central, and West Coast basins. But our strategic goal is to send a lot of that water to the LA Aqueduct Filtration Plant in Silva. Then, for when, once it gets there, we can then blend it with surface water from the aqueduct, run it through the filtration plant, and we can reach 70% of our service territory 
once the water is coming out of the filtration plant. So I really think that is, is basically a, a shift in paradigm that we're seeing. I think the science is there. I think that the fact that there's other utilities and other cities that are you know, going out to programs like this is demonstrating that there's a lot of information. And, and we know obviously that water is a very important thing, it's something you put into your body. Everybody wants to make sure that it meets the highest levels of purity possible. And that is being done. Our partnership with LA Sanitation is one that is going to allow us to utilize every drop of water. We have programs with, with LA Sanitation on Donald C. Tillman, on LA Glendale, Hyperion, obviously, with Operation Next, and also with Terminal Island. I believe we're using every drop of Terminal Island effluent right now for recycling purposes. So we're certainly moving in the right direction. I think the next frontier is the ability to do direct portable reuse. And I think we're finally at a point where we're getting the support that we need from all the parties I mentioned before to make it happen. Very good. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Krikorn, and thank you, Anselmo, uh, and uh, Jason. Um, colleagues, uh, any, any other questions? Mr. Dayon, Mr. Cedillo? I'm going to um, ask just one follow-up, uh, and so based on... No, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I just, I wasn't going to ask any questions. As I think Mr. Corey and I actually asked a lot of the questions I was going to ask, and plus the, the sort of spirit of the commentary, but I'm good. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Uh, Follow-up question in relation to incentives. Uh, again, so Los Angeles is one of the most paved over cities in the U.S., if not the world. Um, there, we've got cement everywhere. Are, are there, have, have we really contemplated incentives for residential and commercial to remove pavement? To, uh, and, and, you know, what would be the anticipated success of such a, an initiative uh, in order to just everyone, you know, more buy-in to replenish our groundwater? That's a great question, Council Member. Uh, as far as removing payment, we really haven't looked at removing payment. However, you know, with technology changes, there is payment now that is more that more uh, porous that would allow you to be able to get the water uh, through the concrete and into the ground. But what I would say is that this is where our stormwater capture program on the parks projects, as part of Measure W, comes into play, because the idea there is for us to be able to build on the ground. Um, basins under local parks that will to capture some of this runoff that we see in the streets that quite honestly just goes to the storm drain to waste. We'll be able to uh, we'll be able to capture that water. We'll be able to then collect it and then use that to reach our groundwater basins. Um, we also have the programs with our spreading grounds. Uh, I think you're familiar with the Tahunga spreading grounds, a project that we finished recently in, co in cooperation with the county flood control we basically doubled the capacity of the spreading basin. So we went from 8,000 acre foot capacity all the way to 16,000 acre feet of capacity. And, and the great thing about that is that we were able to do this in coordination with the county, county flood control, where now they can send water from their retention dams, like Big Tahunga Dam, send it to the wash, and it can make it to our facility. So I, I think that for us, the key is going to be as much as we can and these are kind of, you know, decentralized projects that you can capture the some water in different areas and be able to put it into beneficial use. So that's the area that we're focusing on. And I believe that that's going to make a huge difference in our ability to collect that water and be able to recharge the basin. But you're absolutely right. We uh, are very paved over in the city. So our goal is to try to intercept some of that water that will make it into the stone drain and put it to beneficial use. Great, thank you so much. And Mr. Cedillo has a question. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you, Mr. Krikorian, for your uh, insightful comments. Uh, in one of your comments, you talked about the lack of proximity to uh, the ocean for Las Vegas, but we don't uh, suffer that uh, geographic challenge. And so I'm mean, just said, uh, Mr. Collins, on how we, what our thoughts are on desalination, uh, and 
you know, looking at the other examples, obviously, uh, the Israelis are, I imagine, leading the world in their efforts. Uh, so what's our thinking on this and our, uh, how does this play into long-term uh, strategic response? Thank you, Councilman Cedillo. That's an excellent question. So LADWP looked at um, Ocean Diesel uh, probably 20 years ago or so. And at that time, our general manager uh, directed us and said, well, there are other sources of water that we should fully utilize prior to moving towards Ocean Diesel. And that's the reason why we made investments in the stormwater capture and in recycled water, especially with Operation Next. The challenges that you have with ocean desal are that, you know, as you know, there is a huge resistance by the environmental community. Uh, you probably saw recently that there was a proposal to build one in Huntington Beach, and the California Coastal Commission declined uh, to give them a permit to do that work. Um, I think when we all talk about ocean desal, one of the challenges is that the technology is pretty similar to recycled water, but the amount of energy that it takes to push that really salty water through those membranes is a lot greater. Plus the impacts also that it has on marine life. Um, the way that we're looking at it, council member, is that we want to be able to maximize the water capture. We want to be able to maximize recycled water, the direct portable reuse. And if we get to the point where we still believe that we need an additional um, source of water in our portfolio, and I'm thinking that will be decades from now, that ocean diesel might be something we will look at. Part of the thinking there too is a couple of things. One, technology improvements may get to the point where all those environmental impacts that the environmental community has concerns with, hopefully would have been addressed already. And two, especially with LA100, where we're looking at going to 100% renewable, then the issue about the, the high cost of energy and the energy intensity of, of that system may go away a little bit, that concern. So for us, it's something that we put into the future we have looked at it. We simply made a strategic decision to basically go with what I would call the low-lying fruit first and then have this as an option in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Cedillo. And seeing as uh, there are no other comments or questions, this has been a really great uh, discussion. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, really terrific, illuminating, um, and... Kikorin, you, Mr. Kikorin, you just you just ruined the phrase, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, because it certainly does not. <laughs> so, so that saying is now dead. Uh, <laughs> all right, uh, Mr. Inueva, uh, uh, what I'd like to do is just, we'll receive and file this report because part two is coming uh, at a, a, a soon-to-be scheduled uh, committee hearing. And um, Mr. Van Levitt, does that leave anything else on the desk? Um, the desk is clear, sir. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, uh, again, and this meeting is adjourned.